Hey, everybody, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. We have an amazing program tonight. I want to make sure you get to hear from all of our speakers. So I'll start by welcoming you. I'm Lori Burrows. I volunteer for the Historic Arkansas Museum Foundation Board. To my right is my daughter, Greta. Some of you might remember her when she joined the uh, one of these many, many months ago in Hello Kitty pajamas tonight. She's in a different set of pajamas, but she's going to help with the program tonight too. So we're thrilled you're here and we want to start by thanking our sponsor for tonight's um, program and Greta's going to do that. So go ahead. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Arkansas Grown and Arkansas Made. Each of you got an Arkansas Grown notepad in your gift bag from its farm to school program, which connects schools and local growers in the community to food and farm education about healthy locally grown food. This program also helps with school gardens and getting good food for cafeterias and school stacks to the people who need it most. So thank you so much to Arkansas Made and Arkansas Grown for your sponsorship. And also to the Historic Arkansas Museum Foundation. So several of you are already members of what we call HAM, Historic Arkansas Museum, and we call you the Hamily. And if you are a member, and if you are a member, I hope to see you at my favorite event this Sunday from 2 to 4 p.m., our pie party. If you're not a member, you'll want to become one before Sunday, or we can get you signed up on the spot. If, oh, um, we have a new member goal by the end of the year, so tell your friends. Yes, our family loves the pie party. It's this Sunday, two to four. You get It's exactly what it sounds like. You get pie and it's a party. And it's on the <laughs> museum grounds. And if you want to join that day, we'll take your money that day too. But we're trying to meet a, an annual membership goal. So please join us this Sunday. And so now moving ahead, it's my great pleasure to, um, to introduce to you the person who made the meal y'all got to eat tonight. And I can tell you for my family, we enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, we're grateful for him to be here. I'm also grateful he brought his kids along <laughs> because, you know, it's the pandemic and we're all just doing the best we can via Zoom. So tonight our, our show Chef is John Arrington. He's from the Root Cafe. Um, we also will hear later from Leah Orpen of Black Apple, the Vanessa McEwen of K Historic Cane Hill, and G Guy Ames of Ames Orchard and Nursery. But right now, Greta's going to introduce the chef. Now I'd like to tell you more about the person who created the meal for you tonight. John Arrington yep. has served at as head chef of the Root Cafe since 2015. With 20 years in the culinary in industry and experience with every position in the kitchen, Chef John brings the keen sense of flavor and style to the Root Catering operation, originally from Little Rock. He has served in kitchens across the U.S., including in Chicago and the and the Twin Cities. His unique twist on Southern classics give you an opportunity to experience Arkansas cuisine at its best and most delicious. So Chef John, we're glad to hear from you as we discuss. If y'all have questions for the chef tonight, you can put them in the Q&A in the chat and I'll be happy to ask those for you. But otherwise, we're gonna let him tell us a little bit more about what he created for us tonight. Thank you for being here and for your hard work. Sure. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Uh, we're really grateful for the opportunity to do this dinner tonight. Uh, so I'm just going to go through the dishes that were prepared. Um, the first course we did um, kind of like a salad. We use a pumpkin confit that we then dressed with uh, mint and Korean chili flake. Uh, so we had to like, we had to borrow uh, sushi trays from Rock and Roll Sushi to um, to plate it in. So I made this chili marita romesco, which was kind of a spicier sauce. So we put that kind of in the corner of the plate, like you would your uh, wasabi when you get sushi. Um, then we had some feta puree. We've been working a lot with uh, making mochi cake with different kind of uh, fruits and vegetables. So that's the, the chewy, the chewy little rectangles that were in the dish. That was a uh, apple mochi. Um, on top of that, we had the pumpkin confit. And then on top of that, we had some smoked apples that were then lightly pickled for a couple days. Uh, 
little feta crumble from White River Creamery, some candied pecans, and uh, some micro chervil from Natural State Microgreens to top it off. Uh, next course, we made kind of like, it was a apple pie soup. Um, and then we served that with some vegetarian cheddar cracklins. Uh, the next course was the main. We did some braised pork with a little mashed potato pancake that we seasoned with fermented rye flour, uh, mustard greens, and then Italian fruit mustard relish. Uh, so it's kind of a fun play on pork and applesauce or potato pancakes and applesauce, just kind of all mashed into one. Uh, finally, for dessert, we made caramel apple bread pudding and uh, some hard sauce with apple brandy. Um, wow. So yeah, that was, that was that. We haven't eaten our dessert yet, but now I'm really glad. I can't wait to eat it <laughs> when we're done. Thank It was an amazing meal. I can speak for my family and say it was fantastic. And uh, we love the root. We're glad y'all are in our Little Rock and uh, you provide a lot for the community and you certainly did tonight as well. So um, now's a great chance if you have any questions about the meal to ask the chef. If you don't, that's okay too. He's probably had a long day and he might be okay with just you know, hopping up. But uh, I haven't so far seen any questions in oh. the chat. So I'm looking just to make sure I didn't miss any. But I, we did get a response that said it was all delicious. And thank you very much for your time and for yes. the food. So it was good. It's always fun to hear more about it. And I love the way you use lots of different things to create a really amazing meal. So, oh, and those cheddar cheese cracklins were brilliant. Were brilliant someone said. Good. And they, also, taste like, uh, they taste like cheeses. The, I said they tasted like Parme Parmesan crisp. But regardless, they were delicious. And uh, my kids ate them all. So I got like a bite of one and then they ate them all. So, and uh, someone said, I'm looking forward to it, that the bread pudding was so, so good. good. Someone did say, can you tell us a little bit more about the apple mochi? Yeah, so we, um, it's a little bit different than like a normal mochi. Uh, we're making mochi cake. So um, the recipe we're basing off of, uh, it asks for some coconut milk to go with the sweet rice flour and sugar. We cut the sugar down a little bit and instead of coconut milk, the cake's hydrated with, uh, we just juice some of the golden delicious or the John of gold apples for that. And that's, uh, yeah, that's how we did it. Just make the batter, bake it, Super chill it. Cut it up. Yeah, and then eat it. <laughs> Gobble <laughs> it up. <laughs> so um, I think that's all the questions we had. But again, I want to thank you so much for your for your supporting Historic Arkansas Museum, the History is Served series, and for giving us all such a nourishing and delicious meal that Arkansas Bay. So thank you so much, Chef, for coming and for, the and for letting your family join us too. And uh, <laughs> and, and like we, yeah, good to see y'all. <laughs> and uh, y'all feel free to hang on or if you feel like you need a little nap, that's okay too. <laughs> you did a great job though. Thank you so much for you. what you, you helped us with tonight. It was delicious. So now it's my great pleasure privilege to introduce our next speaker who um, was a last minute change but we're glad to have him so Leah Orpin is here tonight I hope we hope you enjoy the Arkansas made cider that was in your goodie bags and tonight Greta I think wants to introduce him we have the co-founder of Black Apple with us Leah Orpin and he calls himself the unsilent partner of Black Apple which is Arkansas's first cidery so Greta tell us more producing incredible hard cider is an in its natural state, clean and unadulterated, adulterated with no preservatives, you can try 10 different flavors in their downtown Springdale tap room or in bars, restaurants, and retailers around Arkansas. And it's at Black Apple Ingredients Map. That's why they source as much as they can from as close as they can. Arkansas peaches. Ozark apples, fine fresh blackberries. Black apple cares about the people who make your cider. From the farmer to the glass, thanks. Thank you for being with us, Leo. Yeah, we're thrilled to have you. Thank you so much, and we look forward to hearing more from you. I wrote that better myself. <laughs> it is pretty cute when she says it, isn't it? It's so great. Future marketer right there. So, uh, yeah, I, I appreciate you guys having me on. We're uh, 
we had, this has been kind of an exciting ride since we started. We uh, we start we also started uh, in 2015. Uh, summer of 2015 is when we started our first little tap room in downtown uh, Springdale, and uh, it's kind of just blown up since we're all over the all over the state. We've even launched into Northeast Oklahoma with a ton of different brands. Uh, a couple of them, one one of one's a flagship I'm drinking now. This is our hibiscus and we have some fun seasonals like our uh pumpkin spice uh you know now that i'm looking at it from your angle it's all backwards so i'm glad i'm illustrating this uh, <laughs> uh yeah it, it works it, on it, our side we can see it don't worry yeah it's, it, it's exciting though because uh we're six years in and somehow we're still the only cidery in uh in arkansas um which is wild to me but it's just a matter of time just like the breweries, they're going to pop out everywhere and it's going to be exciting. Thank you. Yes. Well, maybe y'all are the only one because no one wants to compete with you. Maybe that's wishful thinking. You got the market corner. Yeah. You know, maybe, so, maybe the pandemic slowed them down. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we want to make sure again, I want to remind you that um, all of our speakers are here to tell you more about your meal and more about the food history in Arkansas. So if you have questions, please pop in into the chat, chat and I'll share them with Leo. So just just to just to fill me in, uh, what what cider was shared with all the meals? That's a great question, Ellen. You'll have to help because I don't know if everybody got the same one. Uh, do, do we send out a variety? That seems like I don't know. We do. got the honey cider. Yeah. Well, we evidently got the honey one at our house. So <laughs> I don't know if it was the same for everybody. And I'm looking to see. Oh, what we heard was that uh, someone mentioned that the Fisher's honey from North Little Rock was used in the cider that we had tonight. Is that true? I, I love that there's somebody out there that knows that. Yes, yes, it's absolutely true. Uh, actually, it was uh, the original cider that we made from that. Um, well, if we really want to go back, we uh, we used to have creative names. And our, it was originally called the El Cariño, which is uh, honey or sweetie in Spanish. Um, but then we we found when we started going out into the market, the more creative the name, the harder it was to realize what you were buying. Uh, so then we just changed it to semi-sweet. Um, and then just recently we rebranded it to honey because it's the most honey forward cider that we have, even though it is a traditional apple cider. But yeah, it is. Uh, uh, it's from Fisher and a majority of those hives are out of Jonesboro, Arkansas. Uh, but it, it is really cool to say that we have a cider that's back sweet with Arkansas honey. That is fantastic. And it's helping the food system too, which is great. Someone asked, what is your favorite cider? Oh, that's going to be my favorite child. My goodness. Um, I'm, I think it really depends on uh, the season. I'm a very seasonal person in everything that I eat and drink. Um, but I will say I'm, I'm kind of a sellout when it comes to, uh, I, I like our flagship, the hibiscus. It's uh, it's forty percent of what we sell. It's our easily our hands down our most popular, and I think it's because it's the most balanced. It's a semi dry. It's super approachable, um, and also if you ever go to any like bar and restaurant that serves it, uh, you'll see this like brilliant red hue uh, that I think is like visually almost addicting. Uh, it gets people talking about it, wanting to try it. Um, but yeah, that, I, I would say I would say the hibiscus is probably my number. Well, and it's funny because someone, while you were talking, had typed and said, isn't there one with hibiscus? So, yes, yes. So it was, it's almost like you could see the Q&A. And someone did say, so yummy and beautiful, too. I'm trying to scroll up. I was told there is a question that I missed in the Q&A, so give me just a second. I'm oh, go ahead. Yep. Okay, I think I caught it with the, uh, but they did say it was delicious and I enjoyed it. So thank you for that. And um, thank you for... Hold on, Greta has said she's okay. What is the production time for a batch of cider? Oh, okay. So that's changed uh, a lot since we started. There, once upon a time, uh, it was as long as uh, six months. It was a really, really long time. And uh, since 2014 to now, it's 2021. We got that down to less than three weeks um, turnaround time from. When we get the uh, when we get the juice and we inoculate it, meaning that we pitch the yeast and start the fermentation process and get a finished product, it's uh, it's about two and a half two weeks. 
uh, I mean, the more industrial equipment and the better you get it, the more efficient you get at your process, the more the quicker the quicker the turnaround time. We also use a very uh, aggressive form of yeast. Uh, if you guys out there, any of you guys are home brewers and want to make your own cider, I highly recommend using a champagne yeast. And we have two more questions. Greta's going to ask these. Um, how many apple varieties do you use? Oh my goodness, um, it's a lot. It's a lot. We uh, so we don't have the so I have an eight thousand square foot facility uh, in downtown Springdale, which sounds huge, and it was huge when we first started. And now I feel like the walls are closing in on us. We uh, we we don't really have the space to store a lot of apples, let alone a press. So we uh, we actually team up with orchards all across the country, and they will press them for us, and we'll usually pick a proprietary blend. It's usually usually four or five different apple varieties to kind of give that balance of acidity and tannins and uh, everything that you need to get a nice balanced base. So when we ferment it, it gives us a nice balanced cider. And then from there, we go ahead and flavor it with delicious things like hibiscus or pumpkin spice, which also has butternut squash in it. Fun. In the and the last question is, where can you pur purchase it in Central Arkansas? Oh, in Central Arkansas. Okay, well, you know, we have a really fun uh, little thing on our website, uh, blackappleheartcider.com. Uh, it's a find us. It's an interactive map that you just put in your address and it'll show every place that sells alcohol near you that has black apple. Uh, we're in about a thousand different locations just in the state of Arkansas alone. Um, and that ranges from bars, restaurants, retailers. I mean, they're all over the place. Um, and we're constantly adding to those as we go. It might be easier for me to tell you where not to find us. Oh, that's fantastic. We'll drop that link into the chat just so in case, just to make it easy for people to find awesome. it. Leo, thank you so much for joining us. It's fun to see what y'all are doing. And it was fun to have you here. And we also appreciated having them in the bag. So everybody got to enjoy it too. So it was a nice compliment for the meal. So thank you so much for being here with us tonight. And and I we know you um, had to come in at the last minute and substitute. So a special thanks for that, for being able to <laughs> pull it together and be so interesting too on short notice. So thank well, you. Well, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we're glad to have you. Now, friends, we have cut Hamily. We've come to the point where we're going to do a poll. So um, our first poll is related to the handout in your bag and Greta's going to ask the question. Um, okay. You can just read it. It's right there. What recipe from the handout are you most likely to try? Single choice. Apple float, rice and apples, apple snow, apple shortcake, apples with onions, fried apples, and ap or apple charlotte. So we'll love to hear what y'all have to share on which one you're looking forward to trying or actually doing yourself, creating. So there were some, in all those great materials you got, there were some recipes. And so I even looked at them ourselves because we love to bake in our house. And so let us know which ones y'all want to try. And I think we're going to wrap it up here in just a second. We'll know what the answer was. So. Yeah, let's see what the answer is. Oh, so the overwhelming favorite is? Apple shortcake. Yeah, that was almost half of you. And there were a few apple floats and apple sh charlottes came in next. So yeah, no. the good news is there's no shortage of apples in Arkansas to make stuff with and plenty of great recipes. So that's that was fun to know. So now just pick one and make one and see, and we'd love to hear what the results are. So, so next, our next guest is uh, someone who's no stranger to the Hamily. She's actually part of the Hamily. She's on the, the commission and we're glad to have her tonight. She's joining us from historic Cane Hill in Northwest Arkansas. She's the executive director there. And she is, like I said, a beloved member of the Hamily. It's uh, Vanessa McEwen. She's no stranger to us and I hope you all know her. Um, and we're gonna let, I don't, unfortunately, Vanessa, I didn't have your bio handy. Um, I just know I can speak to you as a person and say you're lovely and you're doing amazing work up there at Cane Hill. And we're so glad to have you here tonight to give a little more context to apples in Arkansas. So go ahead, Vanessa. Thank you. I'm so excited to, to be with y'all tonight and to see, see some Hamley because I'm 
uh, moved from Little Rock up here to Cane Hill about a year and a half ago, and I, I miss my, my family on the regular. So great to be with y'all. Um, like Lori said, I'm coming to you from historic Cane Hill. Here's our my little background. There's the Cane Hill uh, Church, excuse me, college. And um, so Cane Hill, historic Cane Hill is the organization that, that owns a lot of the historic buildings and has been uh, working on, on uh, restoring uh, and, and preserving the sense of place. Uh, we're about 20 miles from Fayetteville, southwest of Fayetteville, and Cane Hill is one of those communities in Arkansas, in northwest Arkansas, that um, for part of the 19th and early 20th century, apple production was really a major part of our economy and our culture, and um, so I'm here to share with you just a little bit of history about, um, about apple production in Cane Hill. And I know Guy is going to talk more, too, about generally apple history, so I'll, I'll be super specific here. Um, I'm going to oops try to share my screen here. Hopefully that will work. Okay. Everybody see it? Yeah, we can. Good deal. All right. So... Um, this is a, a map of a 1901 map of Benton and Washington counties. And um, these red dots that you see are all um, locations where, where documented local apple varieties originated. So you can see Boonesboro right here with a, the yellow underline, which is another where Cane Hill was known as a lot of different things throughout its history um, since it was founded in 1827. And Boonesboro was one of those, one of those not, uh, names for, for a period of time. So that's kind of gives you some, some geographical context. Um, and the, the UA horticulturalist, Dr. Roy Rom, has documented um, these that you see, apple varieties with origins in Northwest Arkansas. Um, the varieties in red are all uh, varieties that existed or originated within a 12 mile radius of Cane Hill. So right, right there, smack dab in the middle of it. Um, so some of the settlers that came to Tennessee, it came from Tennessee and Kentucky, the same, uh, same people who, who founded Cane Hill, the community, um, and established the Cane Hill College, for which some of, some of you may know Cane Hill um, in the, the 1820s, also brought along apple seedlings. Um, and uh, there, there were some nurseries uh, in the early 1800s, so by 1827, there was a, a Jay Holt had a, had a nursery near present day Lincoln. The Shannons um, in Evansville had had a nursery by 1830. And J.B. Russell had a, a nursery um, right near Cane Hill in 1833. So some early, early apple cultivation there. Um, these are just a couple of, of apple varieties that are, are known to have, uh, have been, been here early on. Um, this is the, the Arkansas uh, that was cultivated near Ray's Mill. Um, the Shannon, um, which again, Boonesboro, another word for Cane Hill, another name for Cane Hill, um, was an early variety. And uh, historic Cane Hill actually has some, some connections with the Shannon family, um, but they're kind of, the, the story about the Shannon, um, the, uh, the development of that is one story anyway. <laughs> I think there's a lot of lore around, <laughs> but one story is that uh, Granville Shannon, who lived in the Boonesboro and Evansboro, Evansville area bought some apple tree seedlings from a peddler and by the time that they bore fruit he'd forgotten what they were called what variety they were and he just named them Shannon apple so that's how they became the Shannon apple. Uh, there's another story that credits the origin of the Shannon apple to Cane Hill nursery owner J.B. Russell so um, competing narratives there but probably somewhere in between there. Um, and then another variety is the Wilson June um, early variety uh, Earls Holt was a, a guy that ran a nursery near Cane Hill before the Civil War, and he actually died before the war commenced, um, and so his nursery was abandoned. And after the war, um, the nursery was cleaned up and many of the apple trees were sold. So Albert and A.J. Wilson bought about a thousand trees and planted them on their father's farm near Lincoln. Um, and there was a, a, a nurseryman named David Moore near Lincoln who uh, Took, took a liking to the apple and took some cuttings and propagated them and named them the Wilson June. So those are some, some varieties that were um, 
known to have, have origins in Cane Hill. I have a few historic photos to show you. And they're really, really cool. Some of them are um, like this one is kind of an unknown time period, but it's, it's people apple picking, un unknown people apple picking in an orchard in Cane Hill. I think it's probably in the 20s. Um, this is also an interesting photo from, from the 20s uh, we, um, of apple picking and thinning in an orchard. And you note the, the long pole they are used to, to thin and pick apples. Um, and the, the, the probably horse drawn looks like wagon up there. Um, you know, apple production was a really labor intensive, um, labor intensive uh, uh, industry. And it, it was not just the picking, it was not just the, um, you know, the pruning, but also the transporting. Um, you know, Cane Hill had, had uh, pieces of the industry to support the apple industry that grew up, you know, barrel stave making and barrels, barrel making, um, and, you know, a whole industry of people who sorted and washed and dried um, and peeled the apples. So uh, it was a it was an important thing. Uh, in fact, one of our one of our um, more well known landmarks um, was built in 1896, and this is the John and Ellis Edmiston House. And John was a, a businessman in Cane Hill, but he ran the family's apple company, uh, which was the Cane Hill Apple uh, Cane Hill Canning and Evaporating Company. Um, and you can see he he did pretty well in the apple industry. <laughs> Um, this is another another cool picture of um, some unknown, unnamed folks um, sorting and grading and culling apples in an orchard in Cane Hill. Um, it's it's interesting to note that there were, um, you know, people, young men, older men, um, and both white and African American men working alongside each other in in this um, in this picture. So. Uh, Cane Hill's apple industry kind of boomed in the, the early uh, 1900s. This is from, this is a picture of downtown um, Cane Hill in 1907. And you can barely see right here, this is the Edmiston Dry Goods Store. So you might recognize that name. They were, they were involved in a lot of different things, but this was really kind of the peak of, of apple industry. And these are all um, the downtown, all horses uh, with apples, um, you know, preparing for them to be canned and shipped and and uh, peeled and dried and all. Um, you know, unfortunately, there were a couple of things that led to the 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 downturn of the apple industry in Cane Hill. Um, one of those was um, the transportation. So in 1901, the Ozark and Cherokee uh, Central Railway came through Prairie Grove and Lincoln. And that, of course, made it easier to ship things further, further away. Um, the, the residents of Cane Hill had opposed the railroad coming through town. And so um, when the railroad came, came through north of Cane Hill, um, the, the apple industry in Cane Hill really couldn't keep up with, um, you know, they were shipping everything by, by horse and cart and couldn't, couldn't uh, compete with that. And so that really led to, um, you know, the death of a commercial industry in Cane Hill um, and a blow to a lot of other associated industries as, as well. This is the canning and evaporating company in Prairie Grove. And we've heard that it, it's very similar to the, the canning and evaporating company that was in Cane Hill, but um, we, we don't have a picture of that, unfortunately. Um, so today, Cane Hill, historic Cane Hill, still has some orchards. They're, they're young. We have some very mature trees and we have some very young trees. Um, and we're, we're, we've, we've worked a lot with Guy to try to get some technical assistance and knowledge and even some, some heirloom trees. Um, and also are working with, with Trey and with Leo uh, to, um, to, to produce some, some apples. Hopefully someday have enough to be able to produce a, a really special historic Cane Hill um, apple cider. Uh, until then, we enjoy enjoy this, but but look forward to to having that happen someday. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to to ask now or get in touch with me. Um, visit historiccanehillar.org, and there's there's more about about our place. And I have to thank Susan Young, who is a recently retired uh, recently retired from the Shiloh Museum, and she is a, um, a board member of Historic Cane Hill, and she. 
uh, helped me put this presentation together. She knows so much about our Ozark history and Apple history. So. Thank you, Vanessa. That was great context for tonight's meal and for the reason we picked the apple to feature and it particularly about what's going on in Northwest Arkansas. And it's lovely to see the collabor collaboration, not only across the region in which historic Cane Hill is located, but even with just people on this meeting, <laughs> on the Zoom. So that's really fantastic. So I'm uh, Greta and I are checking the chat to make sure we didn't miss any questions. It looks like there's one right there. What does it mean to Eva evaporate apples. That's what I was gonna ask. Oh, well, that worked out great. <laughs> um, basically, drying drying apples. They were they were easier. Uh, they were lighter weight. They were easier to to transport when they were dry, um, and they they of course kept longer too. They were well, more well preserved. So drying them. Great. Any other questions? Feel free to drop them in the chat and Greta will happily read them to Vanessa. It is in the presentation. Uh, the pictures are really fantastic. Vanessa, are those um, publicly available somewhere? Are they on a um, I think we have a couple on our website. Actually, some of them are available in um, my predecessor, Bobby Brawley, wrote a, a book, one of the Arcadia press, press books about Cane Hill. And, you know, it's mostly pictures with, with um, some context, um, but, but they're really heavy on pictures. And, um, and that has some great pictures of the, a few of those are from, were used in the book. Yeah, those yeah. are fantastic and certainly completely on brand for what we're talking about tonight. Well, Vanessa, it was lovely to have you here tonight. Thank you for, we're so glad you're part of the Himaly. We're glad you could come back and tie together both your Himaly role and your role at Historic Cane Hill. You're doing amazing uh, work up there and we were really glad to have you tonight. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get, um, we're, I think it's time for our next speaker, we'll get, a, change the screen, get the, there you go. So, okay, we got it, you got it. Thanks so much, Vanessa, we are glad to have you. Now it's time for our special guest speaker who's also coming to you from Northwest Arkansas. His name is Guy Ames and Greta is super excited to introduce him. Guy K. Ames has a BA from Texas A&M Com Texas A&M Commerce. Commerce. An MS in horticulture. <laughs> from the University of Arkansas, Fayetteville. Guy has operated Ames Orchard and Nursery, producing both fruit and fruit plants ad adapted to Ozark conditions since 1983. He's an author of numerous fruit publications, most of which are free at, we'll drop in the- We'll just drop the, uh, the web address in the chat so y'all can have direct access to it. At Ames Orchards, they want to empower you to grow your own fruit. They think that if local is best, then your backyard is the very best. Thank you guys so much for being with us. Yeah, we can't wait to hear from you. And like I said, I'm going to pull out this web address right now and drop it in the chat so that people can get access to your publications. Can you hear us okay? You're, you're on screen. Yeah. You're, um, you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you and your presentation okay. is all systems go. So thanks for being all here. All right. Cool. Thanks. You know, before I forget, uh, you mentioned something, Vanessa, that reminded me that we're going to talk about Arkansas apple industry, the history, but through the lens of ecological history. And uh, that's necessarily going to bring up, you know, some things that aren't so purdy. And uh, when you mentioned the evaporators, uh, what they would do is they would take the apple as far as it could go with the natural sun, you know, with the heat and sun of summertime or fall. But rarely in our humidity was that enough. So they would finish it off with uh, little fires in the evaporators. They would burn brimstone, sulfur. They would burn brimstone. Exactly, Vanessa. That's exactly the right face because it smelled like, well, what, what, what do they burn in Hades itself? Brimstone. So we're, we're going right into Halloween here. So <laughs> these apples, by the way, are both from my place. And it kind of illustrates in a weird way my points. Uh, I'm certified naturally grown, the exact same rules as organic, so I don't use any sprays. If the season is good, 
uh, I can get apples like the one on the lower left. If it's more normal, it's going to be like the upper right. Not all of them, of course. All right. Let's see. Well, huh. Why can't I go down? Ah, there we go. Okay. So I'm going to introduce you to this discipline of, of, uh, of ecological history. There's just a little quote from Lewis Mumford. Uh, he's a philosopher and hist historian from uh, the last century. And this quote, the bottom quote is from William Cronin, who's thought of now sort of the father of ecological history. And this was his main book, Changes in the Land. I happen to have it here with me. It's become uh, not my Bible exactly, but it's very provocative and interesting. It basically is saying here that you can't understand, you know, human history without what it's embedded in, which is the environment. It's just whether we like it or not. And it's that seems, I mean, everybody's going to go, duh. But unless you compare it to otherwise, we generally think of history as, as uh, the workings of individuals and social movements. And if you've read, whoops, I can come back to that. If you've read Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond, you'll understand that. You know, uh, you understand now that most of the Native Americans were killed by disease and not by direct combat or competition with the white settlers that were moving in. I'm going to go back up there. Uh, what do you see in this photo? Well, this is, this is around Springdale. And uh, first of all, as an apple grower and a horticulturist, the first thing I see is too many apples. <laughs> And you're asking for trouble with any kind of crop when you put that crop, you know, shoulder to shoulder with all these other members of the crop, you know. So you're just asking for disease problems, insect problems. The other thing I see, uh, because I'm a grower, is all that white space in between the trees. They clean cultivated the land. That is, they took tillers, plows, and uh, uh, basically you know, kept it plowed up like you would a, a, any other kind of crop, and that degraded it degraded the topsoil. We don't need to spend any more time there. Uh, in the beginning, there was an apple. There's an apple in there somewhere, right? And I don't want to scare anybody. In the beginning, we're not going back that far. We're just that's just a little painting. But this is important. The essential pivotal question of history is always: How did we get here? How did we get here where we are now? And for the purposes of this lecture, here, what we're talking about here, is almost no apple orchards in northwest Arkansas anymore, where once there had been many. And there's just hardly any. I won't even count myself, Leo. <laughs> As you know, you've been to my place. We've got Van Zandt. That's about it. And uh, there's some good... Although the term ecological history is relatively new, there's been many works that fit the bill. And I just want to point out this one, especially Topsoil and Civilization. It was co-written by a, uh, a team a historian and an agronomist from the University of Oklahoma. And you can probably just guess from the title there, Topsoil and Civilization, that they chronicled uh, the rise and fall of civilizations concomitant with the uh, use and abuse of their topsoil. It's really, you start to look at the history of it and you go, oh, uh, yep. So let's go there. So here's some of the factors. If you start looking at this more holistically, we, the first thing we've got is what we're given, right? Here's the ground that we're trying to plant on, that we're trying to grow on. And so the Ozarks is basically a, an ancient, highly eroded plateau. And uh, the agronomists would classify it as an ultisol. And ulti is from the same word that ultimate is from, and it means end, the end. <laughs> it's over. These soils, geologically speaking, are ancient, and they've been uh, weathered, and uh, the fertility has been washed from them many years uh, away. Uh, red clay, rock, low organic matter, low fertility, that's what we're dealing with. Uh, trees, luckily, trees don't really require a lot of fertility, and the witness for that is just outside my window and probably yours, too. All right, here's another factor, the apple itself. So the ancestral apple, Malus sylvestris, is from Kazakhstan, and the climate's kind of semi-arid. It's really not like ours, and it's considerably colder, although it's there's a lot of ups and downs, but basically it's a lot drier climate, and that'd be comes into play here. There's another painting of Arkansas. Uh, apple 
to our benefit is an, what the plant breeders would call an extreme heterozygote. And all that really means uh, to us uh, is that it has a lot of genetic diversity. There's plenty of traits with uh, a broad genetic base that we can play with. And again, witness to that is the adaptability, the relative adaptability of apples around the world. There's a lot of places. I've been to India. I went to India to work with apple growers there. So that's completely on the other side of the globe. So there's apples everywhere. I like to ask people this, what's the purpose of the fruit itself? The fruit. So why is it the fruit? Oh yes, Greta. Can I hear you? Are you a good answer? Okay. Well, to eat, but to the tree, what is the purpose? Why does the tree produce that for us to eat? Uh, to spread seeds? Absolutely. Oh, she's bright. She this is. is. Good. I, I can admit <laughs> it. She is. <laughs> <laughs> I bet really had to twist your arm on that one, Lori. Okay. So, yes. And my point in bringing that up, the, the apple is a, a swollen ovary, <laughs> if you want to get, you know, uh, graphic about it and, and uh, use a <laughs> Leo's going, oh, no, don't go there, guy. Uh, but truly, it's made sweet. It's filled with minerals and sugars and vitamins so that it will be eaten. It's the only part of all these, you vegetarians take notice, it's the only part of a plant that wants to be eaten. <laughs> and that's to spread the seeds around. Okay, here's another factor, our blankety blank climate. <clears throat> And I cannot separate that as a grower. I cannot separate that from disease. This is uh, this little Venn diagram here. They still have Venn diagrams, Greta, school? You bet yes, they do. she knows all about them. Great tool. Okay. In order to have disease, you have to have a susceptible host. And in this case, we're talking about apples. You have to have the presence of a pathogen. And in this case, we have new diseases. If you can see that, new diseases uh, that old world apples had never been subjected to. Therefore, there had been no evolutionary pressure for those apples to develop resistance. So we're bringing these old world plants into, into a new world with new diseases. The other thing you have to have for the occurrence of disease is a conducive environment. And boy, do we have a conducive environment for apple diseases. Uh, it's basically warm and wet. That's conducive because these fungi have to have water to spread and, and infect. All right. Another factor, this is one of my favorite ones because I do have a background in history and English. And, um, you know, King Arthur, well, let's first of all agree that these early settlers were largely, if they weren't Anglo-Saxons, they were Britons of one type or another, you know, Scotch, Irish, English. And um, I hope we can agree that King Arthur is almost an avatar of the culture. He's certainly our folk hero, like uh, uh, Roland would be in France or Siegfried in Germany. King Arthur is ours. Well, when King Arthur died, he didn't exactly go to heaven. He went to Avalon, right? Some of you may remember the story. He went to Avalon, which in Old English is apple land. Anyway, my whole point bringing this up is that apples are deeply embedded in our culture. Of course, I started with the picture of Adam and Eve. You know, we couldn't even see the apple there, but we know it was there. Apples are part and parcel of our culture, which is okay but maybe not enough to, to start a whole industry around. There's another factor, logging. Okay, logging, you know, as soon as the settlers got here, of course, they're clearing land, but not in any big way. And uh, um, By 1880 or about, uh, we started to get some serious logging. And then as soon as the railroad came in, it really sped up. And by 1930s or thereabouts, uh, a lot of those farms were just worn out because of the way that people farmed. And that's why there's so much national forest land. The national forest, the government bought up that land over there in, in uh, uh, Newton and Madison counties. All right. So here's another factor, European style agriculture. Now it wasn't simple, of course, because people that are trying to grow uh, for money have a different way of doing things. Like we saw that first picture going on with that big expanse of apple trees. Uh, homesteaders don't do that. And when they do, they're, they're using seedling trees a lot of the times. Uh, as Leo pointed out, it could be for 
uh, cider. It didn't matter that they were small and sour or whatever. It'd still be juiced and make good cider. And, uh, and even if they use grafted trees, the homesteaders are going to use different trees. They're not going to plant all uh, Ben Davis. That was the apple of commerce for the South. They're going to plant uh, Wilson June. They're going to plant Shannon. They're going to plant uh, Arkansas Black for different purposes, for drying, for sauce, for cider, for keeping. Uh, both, both industrial and homesteading type agriculture would burn off the woods. The, in, the Native Americans did it, and uh, the early settlers did it, and uh, the orchardists, the commercial orchardists did it too. Uh, and it helped get rid of some of the pests like the Plumcoculio and the trunk borers. But uh, it, of course, degraded the soil again. So we're getting this long-term, slow degradation of the soil in the Ozarks as I'm explaining this history to you. And of course, plowing, tilling, that's all they knew. Uh, and I almost hate to say it, uh, I, I hate to say it. Uh, some of our modern herbicides are better than that. At least they leave uh, some debris on top of the ground. Uh, but plowing and tilling is the only weed control is, was an invitation to erosion. Um, and then for home use, this is really interesting to me because for home use, it didn't matter if things were a little bit damaged, you could still sauce it, you could still juice it, it was no big deal. But once you start to market to other parts of the country, you can't tolerate very much damage. They'll rot in transit, and more importantly, the end consumer is not going to be too happy to, you know, to look down and realize he just has half of a, a worm in his mouth and half in the apple still. Um, okay, this is really important down here, the access to markets. So once the trains came in, we'll talk a little bit more about this in just a second. And the reduced tolerance to damage. Uh, it got worse when Washington State Orchards came online. Now, you could say that the, the Washington State Orchardists were probably smarter than the Ozarkers. No. Uh, well, I don't think so. <laughs> no, let's just say no. The difference was, again, an environmental factor. It was an environmental factor as their climate. Washington State Orchards are in eastern Washington. It's High Plains Desert. They get about 10 inches of water a year of rain a year, and they don't have any diseases to speak of. Even the pests they eventually got had to be brought in. <laughs> All right. So here's the railroads. Here's another factor. The railroads, when they came in, of course, they sped up the logging, uh, and the logging sped up the depletion of the soil. The Frisco line, the particular parent line that came through here through uh, this part of the Ozarks, promoted fruit growing along its route. Now, remember, when these railroads all across the United States, the government gave them huge land grants to offset the cost of the rails, right? So they had all this land to sell, the railroads did. They sold it and they promoted fruit growing. So then they would have something to haul with the freight. Anyway, the railroads, and they weren't evil in doing this. They, you know, it was good. They supported the industry. But I'm just saying that this, this led to uh, the explosion of commercial orcharding in the Ozarks. And again, Arkansas apples then traveled around the country, but soon enough, other apples were on that too, especially Washington State. They could just grow. By the way, to this day, Washington State apples are the default cosmetic standard for all apples. And so back east, pretty much uh, east, if you went southeast, we had to spray more pesticides if you're a commercial grower and trying to ship apples just to keep up with the cosmetics of Washington state. So we spray a lot more in the east and the southeast more yet. But of course, there was some really good years. It really only went on for about 40 years. The, the real, what we think of as the heyday of the <clears throat> apple industry. I like to call it the honeymoon years because almost all of us adults kind of get that, you know. At first, everything's cool and then they, uh, they kind of cool down. <laughs> Anyway, a lot of this deforestation, I've already talked about all this. Uh, I don't think we need to go over that again. But this, these are uh, wagons full of apples, probably going to um, one of the facilities that Vanessa showed to dry or maybe to ship off. Now this, one of the last points I'd like to make here, sort of on the dark side, we're close to Halloween, right? So I'm going to get a little on the dark side here. Um, seeing these pictures, and there's a most of the women, at least one of them, one of them smiling. <laughs> the rest of them look pretty dour and sour. 
But knowing what we're going to learn in this next slide kind of changes my opinion of that photo. So, ah, the good old days. So the, they started having problems with the codling moth, which was an introduced pest. It's not even native pest, but it loves apples. It came in on apple crates and cooperage barrels and things from back east. And uh, they needed something to kill it. Well, there weren't any modern pesticides. They used a sledgehammer. They used lead arsenate. I don't know if I could come up with anything more toxic, but that's what they used. And uh, this picture here, you'll notice, I wish I could find the one I, that I really wanted to show. I talked to Susan about it at, at Shiloh, but there's one I've seen. This is a spray rig over here. The horses, notice, are covered with, in a canvas tarp because they were, <laughs> they were valuable. And this other photo I have, there's two guys working the spray rig, which is kind of like one of those railroad cars where you're pumping up and down. And they, they're shirtless <laughs> and they're spraying lead arsenate. Well, you know, so what? That's long ago. Well, it turns out it's still in these soils. So all those little red dots, Vanessa, we can go to those places and probably find residues of lead and arsenic, which really uh, kind of puts a Halloween flavor to this whole thing. Okay, then the pesticide treadmill. This is about where I entered the game. I'm not that old, but let's, let's move up to 1971. When you kill off, when you start using lead, it's amazing to me, but somehow the codling moth developed resistance to lead arsenate. So they sprayed more lead arsenate. That killed off all the beneficials. Now you've got other pests that these beneficials were keeping in check, like uh, scale and uh, leaf hoppers and aphids and stuff. So now you've got all those. When I came to the Ozarks in 1971, uh, hip Billy Homesteader, um, and I was gonna grow all the stuff without pesticides, quote unquote, like the pioneers did. Well, who were the pioneers? So we already know there's two different versions. There's the homesteaders and there was the people that grew them more or less industrially. Uh, I couldn't find an old apple spray guide, but when I first came up here in 1971, if you looked at an apple spray guide, it came down to when you looked at weather uh, and it washed off sprays, 12 to 24 sprays per year, each spray being a tank mix of multiple fungicides, at least two, and at least one and sometimes more insecticides. It was crazy. And it's because of this pesticide treadmill. You start killing off all the beneficials and pretty soon you've got a new pest you didn't even know was there. So this is reality. Mythology versus history, sorry. <laughs> I hope I haven't given anyone indigestion, but this is the truth, this is how it was. And, and this is from uh, the, one of the, the great histories of, of uh, Arkansas apples, Roy Rome being the, the best uh, historiographer of that. But anyway, um, you, we all know, and you, in your booklet that you got, you know what, all the good parts, but you also know Vanessa didn't really try to dodge it. They had problems from the start. And then, of course, there was uh, the arsenic kerosene emulsion that must have smelled wonderful, too, and uh, lead arsenate. And of course, I agree with this last sentence that it wasn't due to environmental factors. It's all environmental factors. It had to be. And I'm hoping that this whole thing that what we've talked about here is just giving you a bigger picture. And that's all I'm trying to do, really. I'm not saying things were good, bad. These people certainly weren't evil. They didn't know what lead arsenate was and stuff. But if you start to look at the whole environment and the whole picture, it becomes a little more... Um, understandable what happened, why the industry demised. And that's what this whole little lecture was about, was how did we get here? How did we get from millions? It was literally millions of apple trees to virtually just, you know, a few thousand that are on very small orchards like my own. Let's do summary real quick. The apple itself, it's not a native. Do we have native fruits? Yes, we have pawpaws, persimmons, muscadines, plenty of native fruits. Uh, we had our own Northern, Northern European food culture, which has its own prejudices. Every culture does. We had a really poor soil to begin with, and that led to the inability of the trees to, um, what's the word, the regenerate. That's the popular word these days, regenerative agriculture. 
And then, of course, when we logged and, and got rid of all the native flora, we induced a lot of perturbations in the environment. Our climate, we're in a, um, in the summertime, it's a temperate zone jungle is what I call it. And it's not ideal for apples. And those rots I showed you in the first slide uh, uh, are indicative of that. Uh, we already know about the agriculture. And then the railroad kind of fed our appetite for profit and put us in direct competition with Washington apples, which, you know, for the marketplace, we just can't match. And this is what I did about it. After I learned that I was going to get my, my hiney kicked by Mother Nature, uh, I decided to focus on producing varieties, trees of the right variety that you could grow with a minimum of pesticides. And that's what I do for a living now. Thanks to all these people. Dr. Jared Phillips down there is a historian at the University of Arkansas. And he's the one that turned me on to environmental or ecological history. That's that. Thank you so much, Guy. Guy mm -hmm. That was super interesting and, and kudos, because I'm, I'm not going to lie, we were a little worried how much time, if you were going to be able to get it all done in time, but you did. You packed a <laughs> lot of really interesting and exciting information in. We did, um, Greta couldn't have enjoyed it more. Um, we did drop in the chat the link so, so people can Good. access your presentations because you're super you. engaging and I'm sure those are all worth a read. So now it's a fun time. We're going to do another poll and Greta wants to be the one to ask the poll question. What was your favorite course this evening? I'm going to give you a few minutes. Okay, so we're going to see what did y'all enjoy most about what we ate tonight? And then we're going to, we have a few closing remarks. We're going to remind you about that pie pork party that's coming up. And then, uh, and then we're going to thank you all so much. And I, let me take this chance while y'all are answering the poll to thank all of our speakers. So we had some amazing speakers. So Greta wants to do that. So. Um, thank you to Chef Arrington. 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 Please visit him at the Root Cafe or contact him about catering. Thank you Leo. to Leo Orpin. Orpin of the Black Bat Apple. Look, look for the ciders around town. I hear the biscuits is really good. Yeah, she hasn't had any, just to be clear. I was supposed to be saying that. <laughs> And we also appreciate Vanessa and Guy. Y'all were all so delightful. So let's see. We, we loved having y'all all wove together nicely. And let's see what y'all appreciated as your favorite dish tonight. Oh. Wow, this one was pretty evenly split, 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 split. Goodness. But the favorite course was? The caramel apple bread pudding with yeah, the, the bread pudding, which we haven't eaten in our house yet, but I can tell you the second we log off of this, we're going to go do that. So, so again, thank you so much to our speakers. You were all fantastic. You really helped us see how important Arkansas, how the apple is to Arkansas's food history. Greta really wants to thank the sponsors again. So, And once again, to thank our sponsors. Arkansas grown and Arkansas made. Can I say that one? And this was it. This was our last um, History of Served meal for 2021. And um, again, we're amazed y'all hung through these for the last two years via Zoom. It's extraordinary. Mm. We're glad you did it. We're grateful to everybody who volunteered, including our four speakers tonight. It was another great year. We'll see what we do next year. But in the meantime, it was another great year. See you at the pie party. Sunday, two to four. And it's exactly what it sounds like. We get together and we eat pie. Don't miss it. And thank you all again so much. Have a great night. And we will see you soon. Hopefully Sunday. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Press it. Okay. <laughs>